All right, uh, can everyone hear me all right? All right. Um, so a little bit different than the initial abstract. Um, the uh, one sec here. So the three L projects um, quite a bit more broad than just a, a scheme operating system. Um, it's actually not entirely specific to scheme. Um, but scheme is involved and Lisp is involved. Um, so the, what got me to the 3L project, um, a few years ago, I was setting up the server, I don't know, for the millionth time. And you got to do a bunch of stuff for the security, right? You have a bunch of config files to edit, firewall rules, users, groups, containers, jails. The list goes on depending on how secure you want to make it. Um, and especially for me, because I change what programs I'm running and stuff, it's hard to like have a permanent script to do all of it. And even to write that stuff, you have to really know what you're doing. Um, and so I was like, is there not a better way to do this? How come there's not a, a simpler way, something that anybody can do? Um, and, and so that's really what started this whole, um, this whole project. Um, so I was already thinking about that, and then um, later on, I was, I was doing programming as I do, and I was getting um, really frustrated. So I was, you know, writing some scripts on the command line, and I was like, why are we still passing text from one program to the next with pipes? Every program's got to serialize it, deserialize it, create their own structures. It, it seems so old and seems like we could do better. And I thought, like, my IDE, too. It's really just text. Like, it can kind of run compilers and kind of give you some text highlighting. But even though I can interactively develop my programs, like with Lisp, I can evaluate forms. The, the IDE doesn't really know it. It just tries to guess a bunch of things. And so I was like, is this the best we can do? And, and so I'm looking at what's changed. Um, that's okay. <laughs> So I was looking like, you know, historically, have we really made a lot of progress? And in some ways we have, um, but in, in a lot of ways we haven't. It's still roughly the same, and we tend to be remaking the same things over and over again, the same debuggers, same IDEs. Um, so I was like, is this the best we can do? We can't do any better than this. Um, and so I got into to looking at developing even more, like your documentation, does it have to be completely separate? Is it only text and links? Um, can I document my variables? Why can't I do that? Why can't, why does documentation for a variable have to be a comment in the code? Why can't that be part of my overall documentation? Why can't my program write programs to manipulate that documentation any way I want? Then my IDE could get it. Um, so I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking like, there's probably a lot of things we could do better. So then I keep asking myself questions like, um, when I'm programming, why can't I inspect my environment? Why can't I look at what variables are in scope, what their values are, what the code in a closure is, and modify that code without recreating my closure or my objects? Um, and, and going to look at applications. Like, an application crashes today, what do you do? Right? There's not much you can do. I updated my system, application crashes. Might get an error message, probably not. Maybe the command line can tell me something, probably not. So what do you do? You Google it, you're like, oh, okay, library incompatibility, whatever. I'm like, man, there has to be a better way to do this. Um, and, and then I'm like, what about other things? Like, uh, like OpenSSL, does it have to have a buffer overflow vulnerability every three days, you know? Does this, is this required? Uh, you know, why can't I script my user interfaces? Are file systems really the best way to do things? We can't do any better than a file system? Why is it so hard to pass data between my applications? Like, shared memory, okay, now I have to have like, you know, if I'm doing concurrency, now I have to have a mutex that's kind of shared between different applications, and it's a lot of work, and I'm thinking, why can't we do better? And then you get into drivers, and drivers are really hard to write. They're really buggy. And, and it's like, what are we doing to improve this? And there's not really anything. People are still doing it, you know, writing some code, compiling it, rebooting it, 
it's a lot of work, um, it's really slow. Um, and so then I started um, trying to imagine um, what we could have in the future um, and how that compares to where we're going right now. So I'm trying to imagine solutions to all these problems um, and what this could look like, um, say 30 years down the road. And I thought, you know, is this possible? So I started doing a lot of research, um, looking at different security models. You know, have we learned something with security? Have we learned better models for programming so there's less bugs in applications? And there actually is a lot of research we've done um, the past few decades that we just aren't using. We're still basically using the same kernel architectures, the same um, model of programming we have been for many, many years. Um, and our hardware has gotten faster, which means things look prettier. Um, and we can use higher level languages, so it's a little bit faster. Um, but really, things haven't fundamentally changed. We still have all these bugs. We really haven't reduced the number of bugs, right? So I started doing all this research, and it's like, We've had a lot of toys and a lot of research, but nobody's really brought it together um, and put in the effort to um, drive things forward in a significant way. So that's uh, what eventually led me to starting this project. After a few years, I said, all right, it's time to do it. So we're going to build something concrete and take all this information and build a system that we enjoy using, um, that creates less bugs, and is just better for everyone as a whole, easier to secure, um, especially with networking only growing, security is more important. So that's how we end up with the 3L project. And the goals of the 3L project are to, to answer those questions. So the first, um, uh, so I'll first be talking about Scheme. So, my first concrete implementation was in Scheme. I thought, I don't really know the right way to do this, but Scheme's easy to do, you know, implement and run on bare metal pretty quickly. Um, and it does have a lot of answers to those questions, obviously not all of them. Um, but I thought I need something concrete to learn from um, and evolve. Um, then I'll be talking about 3Lisp, which is sort of um, a foundation that Scheme and Common Lisp and other languages can be built on that uh, answers more of those questions better than Scheme can. Then I'll be talking about uh, 3L OS in general and the 3L project from a higher perspective. So we have a demo of our first version. So right, what you see here is a Scheme, R7RS Scheme, running on bare metal. Obviously, it's an emulator, so I can show it on the screen. Uh, but you can put it on a USB disk, 64-bit machine, boot it up, and you have a, a scheme REPL. You can type in everything you want. Um, so we can type a regular function here. Get our answer. Um, has, has all your basic uh, scheme features. Um, list features in general, so we can evaluate code, we have eval, we have quasi-quote. Where it gets more interesting, though, is for doing things like driver development um, and directly interacting with hardware. So what you see right here is a VGA output, and the way that works at a low level is you um, map um, memory um, for the VG, for VGA output into a specific location in your memory. And so you can write bytes to that memory and it shows up on your VGA display. So basically all you have to do to display something is write some bytes and it displays it, right? So we can actually directly write to this memory. So this is what you do with drivers. You write to memory and it displays things. You set you know, various gates. Um, so this is a standard high level um, scheme port object. And if you notice, oh sorry, I went a little too quick. But if you notice up in the corner, the left corner, it now says hello world. It wrote over the hailing frequencies open. 
Um, so what that did is write to that VGA memory straight from my REPL. So I can develop all my drivers this way. I can interact with the hardware. I can read information from the hardware, write to it. And that's built on a lower level port um, called a byte port. And so this will write a byte directly to VGA memory. Um, 80 is our ASCII value, so we'll see a capital P. And the position is a, starting at zero again because it's a different port. So in the upper left corner, you'll see a P overwrite the H. So now we see we have a P up there. Um, the next thing we can do is set the color. So the second byte is the color for that character. So the way the VGA memory works is you write the ASCII value, you write the color ASCII value as, you know, as, as we go all the way through, right? Um, and so in this case, I'm, I'm going to set the color. It's slight calculation to figure out what byte you set to get a different foreground and background. But when I do this, you can see the P changed colors, right? So this just demonstrates um, the, the improvements this gives us. It's really easy to interact with our hardware. It's really easy to, to build things. It's not a separate recompilation phase and reboot. And um, also means as a programmer, you're just having fun. You can go in and mess around with your hardware. You don't even really have to know as much as you would otherwise. Um, it also has security features, um, the, the byte port. Um, when you set it up, um, you tell it what memory location to start at, and you tell it a limit. Um, so unlike most drivers where um, the bugs usually come from overwriting or writing to the wrong memory location, this makes sure you only write to the locations related to what you're working with. Um, so it improves uh, the situation in that way as well. So that's, that's V1. That's what we have right now. It's not running on Linux. This is just bare metal, a scheme, scheme uh, REPL. Um, so, of course, I'll address why I use Lisp for all this. Um, uh, so far, it seems to be the most expressive way to achieve the goals of 3L. Who knows, maybe at some point we'll discover Lisp is not the best way to do this, but so far it seems by far like the most powerful way um, to build the system. Also, I'll talk about it more later, but DSLs are really integral to, this, um, to the 3L project. And of course, Lisp is great at DSLs, um, much better than anything I'm aware of. Um, so, and I kind of like Lisp, so <laughs> that's a good start. So we saw um, the scheme version, um, and I ran into issues um, in trying to reach my goals with that. Um, in some ways, it was too high level and not expressive enough. There's also some baggage that's picked up over the years. Um, there's issues where user-defined types are not quite I'm on the same level as primitives, um, which is similar to like common Lisp. Um, it also doesn't allow for um, the like introspection and reflection features. I wanted um, what I was talking about earlier for like documentation and, and uh, having good IDE integration. Um, it, it, I couldn't find a good way to do that in Scheme. So the goal is to write a bottom level Lisp that Scheme and Common Lisp, other Lisps, and, and, and hopefully other languages can be written on top of. So the goal isn't necessarily to write everything in three Lisp, but to provide a foundation um, and then take advantage of um, other software that's already been written. Another thing to note about um, both the Scheme version 1 and 3Lisp is it's written in something called pre-Scheme. It's a subset of Scheme that can be compiled to C in machine code. This means that there's no GC, um, you, you can't use closures, there's a lot of limitations. But the, the unique part is you can run it in any Scheme implementation we have already. So you can run it in Guile or Chicken Scheme or Larceny. So most of my development with a small um, sort of emulation layer is actually done in Chicken Scheme, 
Um, so I don't have to do the recompilation phase, even for the things that must be pre-compiled. I can do it all with a debugger and a profile profiler. So that makes the process go a lot quicker as well. Um, so both version one and three lisp are written in that way. Um, the, the features of three lisp are about what you'd expect. Um, it's by default a lisp one, but I'm uh, working on a model to support lisp n, lisp two, three, lisp four, which is arguably what common lisp is. Um, all integrated, so you don't, you don't have to have separate namespaces necessarily um, to interact between scheme and common Lisp. Um, and even more notable is the representation for environments and functions. Um, and you can also um, use functions and macros um, interchangeably. You can compose them. Um, they're not as much of a separate world. They don't necessarily live in a separate world. Um, so I mentioned some of those goals. Experimentation is also a big factor because I think we don't necessarily know what the best way to do things is yet. So the, one of the goals is make us so we can iterate really quick, figure out better ways of doing things. Um, and also, like I was saying, integrate with maybe JavaScript, Python, and Ruby on top of um, Lisps in a way that doesn't like require a separate compilation phase, maybe just a reader instead. So you can... Um, you know, share variables across languages. Um, some of this is possible, some of it's not, but trying to do as much of that as possible. Um, so now we'll get into some coding. Um, the, I was talking about the typing earlier. This isn't um, necessarily super unique or fundamental, but it'll help explain some stuff I talk about later on. Um, there's a, a type interface with four functions, type tag, untag and value. So we'll look at um, what this actually looks like. Sorry, I had a cold, got to drink some water. <clears throat> so We'll, we'll look at our type interface. This is not yet compiled with pre-scheme. I'm almost there, but I'm not soon, hopefully. Um, so this is running in chicken scheme. E is basically eval, so you won't see that in the pre-compiled version. So just ignore that and look at the, the stuff that's quoted. So we'll check what the type of the primitive zero is. We see that the type of it is number, which seems pretty logical. Um, we check what the value of zero is. This comes. This is important for later when we have user-defined types. But this is what um, unifies unifies the whole system. So value returns zero. The value of zero is zero, um, which seems pretty obvious. But then we start getting fancier. So here we're going to set the variable z to um, a a type of zero, and the contents of it are the value zero. So we're creating a new type here um, called zero. You could make a, your binary port or your terminal port would be types, um, and you can store values in them. So this could store any structure you want. It could store a linked list, or whatever you want. Um, but it's just a way of adding type information, right? So we set z equal to zero. Oh, also I should note, I'm taking the car of quote there. That's because in this system, quote returns the coder of um, the contents instead of the car. Um, that may or may not change. <laughs> That's what it is right now. Um, so now we see that the type of our variable z is zero. But we can come in and look at the value, so the contents of that object. If you had a different data structure in there, when you type value, you'll get the, the internal data structure. We can untag it to get our original value, and we can check that the untagged version is a number again. So it's not entirely important, but it does unify the system, since you can use type and value the same way on primitives as you can user-defined objects or types, whatever you want to call them. 
So now we'll get into the more unique features. Um, probably the most unique being the environments. Um, if you're not familiar with what an environment is, um, your evaluator or um, runtime or your system, no matter what the language is, has mappings from um, a variable name to a value, right? So x equals 1. Um, in, in Lisp, this is often called an environment. Um, so it's a, a data structure that will map um, a variable to a value. Um, it's not too complicated. The unique part is how I represent um, environments to the user. Um, if you've done basic Lisp implementations, this might look familiar. Um, but it's actually a fundamental part of 3Lisp. Um, so I can show you why. But, um, so we can, we can call environment. I'll go over a simplified example, and then we can look at an actual demo. Um, so you can call a function called environment, and it returns you the current environment. So right here, this is showing you the top level environment. X is equal to 1, Y is equal to 2, define is equal to, I just put an asterisk to denote it's the primitive version of define internally. So you can see it's represented like that. You can see I type in X it equals 1. Now this is where it gets more interesting. So we'll go back here and turn in our environment. Um, That's why I had the example. Um, I have a lot more things defined here, and internally primitives look like record, print out as records in the system, but you can see um, our variable z. Um, so now we can say um, set x equal to 5, x is indeed 5, and now we get our environment, and you can now see x here is the beginning of the first list, and then the second list, which is stored in the cutter, is our value 5, right? This is actually the same structure the entire internal interpreter, compiler, whatever is using. So we can directly manipulate the environment. So right here, what we're doing is taking that um, representation of our environment Picking out the location that maps to x, which in this case is the value, I should uh, actually not point. So we have x, um, that's the first position of our list. 5 is the first position of the second list, right? So what we do here is we pick out 5 out of that list, and we set it to the value 6. So now. You'll note x equals 6. Um, in some cases, in other lists, you might be kind of able to do this um, via some APIs, but it's not a regular list structure. Um, of course, in Lisp, what's better than linked lists that you can use all your list utilities on? Um, you could map over your environment. You can do what I wanted earlier. You could see what values my variables are. You can see what's in scope. Um, so we get all of those advantages, and we actually get more. So uh, so the next uh, unique difference is the way functions are um, represented. So like environments, our functions are represented as a list. The first item in the list is the environment that we were looking at earlier associated with that function. Second element is the arguments, and the third element is the body of that function. So we'll come back here. Um, let me clear this out here. All right, so what we're going to do here is create a function. And we're going to call it add1. Uh, you'll see uh, this is a little bit different. Um, it's just less typing, more clear for my example because I'm running it in chicken scheme. But the real version will look um, like I have here. Um, anyways, so the first element of our list is environment. Second is the argument A. Body of our function is A plus 1, right? So we define that function, and we can call it, and we get our value. 
Um, we can um, look at the environment of that function. We can introspect. We can reflect over it. We can modify it. We can set it to a different environment. So you could um, create a closure out of that function if you wanted retroactively. You can look at the source code of your function and modify it um, internally, or if it's already in a closure, you can go look at the source, navigate through it just like a regular Lisp list. Uh, oops. So the next thing to note um, if you're not familiar with um, writing interpreters and all this stuff, um, you, what we're looking at is a top-level environment. Um, when you make a function call with lexical scoping, it um, creates what's called a new frame. So your top level is, is a lower frame. You make a function call, and it creates a new frame. A frame is the variable mappings for that function. So in add one, we have a new frame that maps a um, to uh, whatever the, you know, one in this case. So A would be equal to one. So that's the way we can get um, um, our scoping. So if you refer to A in that function and there's an A declared in the top level environment, we get the A you expect. And Here, we can see that's going on. So we make a function call. This is our top, this is the current um, top level frame that we've pushed onto our stack of frames. So inside our function, I should explain that first. So here we've defined a function like we did before. It's an anonymous function, and we're gonna pass in the value three and four. It takes arguments a and x. And we call our environment function here um, as the body so we can see what it looks like. And we can see that A is indeed mapped to 3, X is mapped to 4. Um, I cleared out our previous values so it's cleaner, but you can still see our mappings from, from the original environment. You can ask now if you want, you can wait. <laughs> It's, this is very slow. I can explain that at the end if you want. All of this is very slow. <laughs> so, right. Right. So you can do a separate analysis phase um, that will add information to your variables to tell you which frame the, the variable will be in, so you're not scanning through all of these. Um, in, at least in development mode, I don't do that because you can actually add an argument and modify the value of a body. Um, and if you have an analysis phase and you do that, you'd have to reanalyze everything in your entire system to add just a new argument. So at least when I'm developing, you're in developer mode, having fun, um, you can do that. Um, if you're going in production mode and you want it faster, you'll probably want to pre-compile it and you won't be able to do that. Um, but yeah, so now we can see um, that indeed uh, x is mapped to 4 like we saw earlier in our environment. So the whole point of all this is now our IDEs and our tools, everything can look at the entire world. It can analyze it, it can modify it. Um, so we're not living in sort of a separate, two separate worlds. We're not just text anymore. We have the actual representation. Our IDEs can hook into everything. We can navigate through source code. We can be on a library function and go straight to that source code, modify it. It'll be reflected over everything in the whole system. And it gives us other advantages. So another thing I really wanted was this meta information I was talking about where you can document variables. Um, and you can actually add any sort of meta information you want. So you can tag things, um, you know, add your own search terms. You can search through things. 
And it works the same exact way as the variable mappings did. So like we have plus maps to our primitive plus. Well, we can attach another list onto the end of every frame. And we can know that um, plus maps to the meta information with documentation, addition, operator, and those tags. Um, any of those can be any list structure you want. So if you wanted to link your documentation, you could theoretically make your documentation out of a linked list. And the first is um, the, the written out documentation. One's a synopsis. And another one is a linked list pointer to documentation in another library. Um, so again, your IDE can just directly manipulate anything. Um, you can build a document explorer for the whole system, um, navigate through it, modify the source code while you're looking at documentation. Um, so there's a lot of power in being able to do that. Uh, it also allows you to do things like debugging and profiling um, directly in user space. So you can go into that environment if you wanted to, to, to debug something, you could uh, modify the value of a function, the body of a function, to insert a bunch of debugging code, right? You can do that retroactively. We no longer have to build a separate debugger that lives in its own world. Um, so it's really easy to do. It's fully integrated. The IDE can do it really easily. You can do the same thing for profiling. You can instrument it all in user space. You don't have to do anything special. Um, also note, um, I, won't, I won't do a demonstration of it, um, but macros are slightly different. Um, if you're familiar with ARC, it's very similar to that. They're just functions that, with the type system we saw earlier, we tag them as macro. Um, the interpreter will know it's a, a macro and expand it, but it happens at evaluation time. Um, so there's not necessarily a separate block level macro expansion phase which means you can retroactively change the definition of a function and have it apply to other things you've been defined. So you don't have to be like, oh, I got to go back and re-expand all this stuff that I, I created with my macros, depending on where you've used the macro, of course. Um, allows you to also use that a function as both a function and a macro really easily. And it even allows you, in a lot of cases, to compose macros, past macros to apply. So you could apply the macro and to a list of arguments, which you wouldn't normally be able to do. So there's just a, a basic example. It's, it's not really any different than we were looking at before. Um, so that, again, just makes it easier to experiment, easier to integrate DSLs. So now. Um, we'll move on to the OS as a whole. Um, this will be a little bit more broad. Um, a pro this is a running as a single Lisp image. So the programs don't have a separate, um, aren't mapped into their own memory space. Um, everything's running as one, one image. Um, in a program, you just call a function, right? So I'm running Tetris. It, you can run it in a separate thread if you want to do multitasking. Um, Pretty basic. Um, part of the issue with running it all in one address space, of course, is your, your security. Um, and that's baked in at, a, at the most fundamental level of the system. Um, and it's very simple. It applies to everything. Um, so it's, it's very, very easy to create a very secure system. You have the basics. The, everything from the, everything in the whole system, type, bound, checked, as you'd expect, all that kind of stuff. Um, but the unique part is the fine-grained containerization. So right now, to, to secure things, a lot of the times we'll put them in containers like jails or we'll make exo kernels or, or do things like that, which kind of do what we want, but they're really, really heavyweight. Um, and they're a lot of work. Um, and they're not really that great unless you spend decades tweaking it to only have exactly what you want. So what we do instead, um, and if you saw another talk I did, I talked um, about this more specifically. This is same concept, slightly different API than I had before, just because of the way environments are represented. Um, but 
uh, we can call the enclose function, and the body of that function can be restricted in what it can see. And, and by that I mean what will be in scope for it. So the, the first argument to enclose is our root environment, the second is the child environment. Um, then after that we have the body. Um, and close essentially does a deep diff on the environments. Um, and so child environment can refer to anything in the parent environment it wants. But the body can only refer to things defined in the child environment. So as we see here, we have our normal, um, we have our normal uh, environment call, gets our environment. And we're just creating an ad hoc environment um, that references the add one function we created earlier. And you can see in the body here, add one works just fine as we'd expect. But we can't access the addition operator since we did not include it in our environment. So what this means is you can say run your Tetris program inside an enclose and only pass in the things that you want it to have access to. So it, it moves um, control over the system from um, the, the programmer to the user. Now the user can download something off the internet and say you only have access to these three different things and that's it. If it tries to do anything else, gets an exception because it's not defined. Yeah, so, um, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so let me get, see if I can get this right. So if you have access to things like set car and set coder, um, can something in the body of the enclosed call refer to or modify something in the parent environment um, by setting the car or coder of, say, a function in the child environment, which would escape our enclosure, right? So what enclose actually does behind the scene is wraps things that shouldn't be seen in a tagged enclose. So I think, um, I guess I don't have it specifically, but it wraps it, it tags it as type enclose with the typing mechanism we saw earlier. The interpreter is specially um, designed to recognize that. And so it, it won't allow you to modify it um, unless um, you allow it to unless you expose a way to do that. And it doesn't allow you to see the contents. So if I call env inside my enclose, I only see things that weren't um, tagged and closed. So I can see everything that was exposed and I can still look at my environment, um, but I, I can't do anything that the user didn't want me to do. I don't have access to anything else. Does that explain it? Yep. Contains the of plus, right? Yep. Um, so let's see. The the plus function would be returned as the enclosed type. So it won't be the primitive plus anymore. It'll be enclosed and the interpreter will say, no, you don't have permission to do that. How do you deal with uh, resource halts? Uh, with yeah, so that's a, a separate, separate entire issue, um, which will have an API for it. But you can, since we have control over the whole system or one image, um, we can track how much memory something's using, how much CPU, every resource we want, right? And so you can say you're allowed to use 15% CPU, or you could even create a library that says you can print 10 pages an hour, or you could say you, you can cons this many times an hour, whatever you want. Yeah, so 
so you can, the way that would be handled in a lot of cases is you would create a library specifically for that program that controls that access. So instead of like importing um, something that has direct access to memory, you create an intermediary that controls, like for an example, if it was a file, um, you could say, create a special library just for my web server that when the user tries to use the file API, it only ever returns the one file it needs. Does that make sense from a high level perspective? Well, I, I'm, I'm down at a more basic level. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Well, that's, that's what you can do. You can, you can run a function in, in a, so, so you can essentially use a macro or a function call to call another function, but you can say, this function is only allowed to allocate this much memory, and the interpreter will keep track of how much memory that function call has used and kill it if it runs out. Does that make sense? Uh, a what? Uh, you don't have a process specifically. You run a program. Yeah, a process is a function call. So that's, that's what it comes down to. Oh, you have thread. yeah, you have threads. You can, all of them can be set resource limits on them. Oh, yeah, so, so the question to repeat it um, for the record uh, was how do you contain um, memory leaks, runaway processes, a, a process that tries to do a denial of service? Um, there's actually a ton more that goes into security. I don't have forever to go into all of it. That'd be a whole nother hour long talk if I was going to do it. But uh, so this is what we were seeing earlier. Um, and this is what I was, I was kind of talking about. A quick example will be, say, a web server. Say our web server doesn't need to access any files. All it does is um, take a request do a calculation based on that request and send a response. When I call and close, I can pass in um, the specific functions I need from the networking library that it needs to use, the specific mathematical functions that it needs to use, and a port object that only refers to port 80. What this means is if somebody breaks into this web server, because the whole point of this is the limit damage. You, you, Something could happen at any time. You're just trying to limit your damage, right? Somebody breaks into this web server. There's no way they can do anything else. They can't access the file system because it just doesn't exist in their environment. Um, and you can even segregate up your programs into different enclosed. So like your server might have one part that accesses files and one part that handles something else. They can both be enclosed. So if somebody breaks into one part, they can't get to the other part. Um, of course, with all of this, you might be thinking that's a ton of work. Um, so one of the other fundamental features is configuration of all these environments um, and, and handling all of that. Um, one of the big advantages compared to what we have now is it's just one unified system. So you can specify it in one file or however you want to do it. Um, and as the distributor of the 3LOS, you would have all those predefined. Um, when you write a package, you can predefine it yourself, but the user can, of course, change it if they don't like the defaults. Um, you can also have um, something pop up dialogues. So, you, you know, similar to like Android or iOS, you have a dialog that says, Are you allowed to access this? Except this could be infinitely more defined depending on what you want to. Um, present to the user to select um, what permission something has. Of course, um, when you're developing it, you might not want all those limitations. So you can, um, depending on how you set it up, one example would be have it reboot into development mode where enclose is basically ignored. So I can do whatever I want. I can fully develop it. Um, you could reboot it into secure mode so that Everything's locked down, um, and I'm working on also a way to do it in a partial fashion um, so that some things can be enclosed while you're developing other things. Um, I won't go into that. Uh, so you may be saying we've seen some of this before, right, with Lisp machines and genera, whatever. Um, and we have, and we've seen similar things with Smalltalk. Um, and 
And what I'm trying to do is, is take all of that information, take research we've done on security, um, take all of this together, which hasn't been done, um, and also you know, asking why don't we have those anymore? Um, and there's many reasons. Um, <laughs> Part of it is probably related to performance of the hardware compared to other hardware. Um, so the thought is 30 years from now, hopefully our hardware won't be a limitation. Um, so some of these crazy ideas, you might be thinking that's way too imperformant, it would never work. Um, but we're thinking long term. And part of that is performance is directly related to your hardware, right? That's all it is. Performance relates to hardware. We don't necessarily know what our hardware is going to look like, and we might be able to develop hardware that works better for this. So right now, the focus is on building a really strong system, getting all the, the fundamentals right, and then when we're, we're actually building the final system, you look at what hardware you're targeting, and then you can optimize for it. Um, I'll quickly go over, it's, it's a big, big subject, but another, another interesting feature um, is an answer to my question about file systems. So um, 3LOS uses basically a semantic web instead of a file system. So um, I'll start out by describing what that would look like as a file system, which um, hopefully makes this more clear. So a file system could be represented by a linked list, right? So your root would be a linked list of pointers to other linked lists if it's a directory, right? Or if it's a file, it can just, that, that cell in your linked list can contain the contents of that file. Um, and so we can build our whole file system that way, right? It's essentially the same thing. Um, we might want to attach meta information, such as file permissions, so we could enclose all of that in its own object, like each, each list is an object that contains permissions or whatever, and each file contains permissions. Um, so, so that makes sense, right? We can represent our file system that way. And we have, but then we can say, if we're representing it as um, a linked list or some other data structure, why not um, allow other parts of our, our file system reference um, via pointers, other things. Um, so you could instead create a web, right? So anything can link to anything. And at first you might be wondering, like, what good is that? Um, it it um, provides for a lot of power um, when it comes to actual content. So, so you're programming and you have your source code. Your source code could be represented as actual data structures. Um, as we saw function definitions, they are a data structure, they're a list, right? So our web could plug into that list. It can still contain, you know, meta information like the user typed this much space, so in my editor I show this much space, but now we can um, have explorers that navigate this web of information. So go from internal objects in our source code to a document I wrote um, about it or a presentation. The presentation could link directly to the function definition, so I'm not switching from here to my IDE to show you examples. They're all just linked to each other. A big topic, I know that was kind of high level, um, but um, other basic things 3LOS can work on is system-wide concurrency um, and power consumption, um, which is highly related to the, the wake-ups on your hardware. Um, when you have full control of the system, you can make it much more optimized than what we have right now. It's similar to what Android and iOS kind of try to do via APIs, but we can do a lot better when we have control of the whole system. Um, I'll just talk a couple um, general things about the higher level project. So when I'm thinking about all of this, especially from a programmer standpoint, um, one of my main theories is programming is people describing solutions to problems, right? So what we need to optimize for is people um, when we're writing code. So one of the ways I hope to make this more practical in terms of dealing with rewriting all this code, you're thinking, oh, this is impossible, too much code to rewrite. Um, 
one of my goals is to look at how people interact with software, how they interact with the world, and develop better tools for that so that we can develop software with less bugs and allow us to write code faster. Uh, one of the principal areas of research in this is language tools. Um, so, so humans, our brains, we think in languages, right? So nouns and verbs, all that kind of stuff. So um, working on building tools so that you spend some of your time building um, languages or DSLs to describe everything you do. So um, instead of layers of libraries, um, you, you have a, a language to describe networking. Um, so you have nouns and verbs to describe networking, and you mix those into your web application or whatever. It's an area of research um, related to um, trying to move computing forward in other ways as well. Um, it also makes advances on things like package management, which is a big deal in the system because things aren't separate programs. They're all functions. Um, one other interesting last thing is um, one of the things I've always been frustrated with is not being able to use source code that I want to use. Um, maybe it's GPL, and I'm working on something in BSD, whatever. It's really annoying, right? I mean, I'm sure we've all run into that. So. The 3L project um, releases code both under um, public domain, explicitly giving up copyright, but it also allows you to relicense it under any license you want. So if you want to use it in a GPL product uh, project, you can. You can use it in BSD. Um, you're not locked in. You can use it in whatever you want. So that's a quick summary of the 3L project. You can. Go to the website, and if you want to be updated, find out um, when there's releases, ask questions, learn more information, you can um, join a mailing list. So you want to know what the differences are between this and a Lisp machine? Yeah, there was a symbolics one, a TI one, or Yep, yep. So the differences between this and a Lisp machine are, I like to think of it as taking that and, and sort of bringing it further along. Um, so that's why part of that's the security. They had no security. <laughs> um, and they also uh, dealt with lots of different low-level, sort of like byte codes, but specific to the car and cooter machines. Um, it wasn't necessarily Lisp all the way down. It was sort of, um, which this is trying to, to fix this issue. It goes all the way down. There were a lot of issues with that. You could, you could mess things up really badly because um, there weren't. Uh, when you when you use those low level utilities, um, so I'm trying to fix that, um, and a lot of it is the longer term um, experimentations. So part of the goal of this is to make it really really easy to experiment um, with the idea that um, 30 years from now we don't necessarily what we what what we are going to have. Um, so from the ground up, working on making it super easy to experiment. Um, especially when it comes to languages, so building language tools, um, trying to incorporate things from other languages like small talk and small talk environments. Um, starts out as a simplified system. It's not super dramatically different, um, just going for, because I think they were on the right track. They were way more interactive, um, very powerful. We went back a few decades when, when we lost those. So, I've tried to say, we'll start with that. We'll bring in all the research we've done on security and all this other research and pull them forward. Does that answer your question to some degree? <laughs> and there's a lot of other things, but any other questions? Uh, yeah, so is my code available? Not at the moment. Um, 
The original Scheme version, I, I could make it available, but it's going to be pretty much useless because I wrote it in about a month and the code's indecipherable and I'm not planning on using it, but I guess if you wanted to look at it. Um, it also has a bunch of dependencies on bootloader stuff I modified and you'd have to patch. Um, so running it yourself would be very difficult. Um, the new version, though, is, is uh, much cleaner, um, and I hope to launch it soonish and give you the code um, as, as quick as I can. It took, I was hoping to have it done for this, but it's probably a week off still. So I had to give the examples in the, the interpreter. But. Well, I was curious. At least look at your report of Chris Key, because uh, if I remember, I, I think he posted something about that he said he was using Chris Key. Yeah, I'm using Chris Key. Uh, so the question was, did I port pre-scheme to chicken? No, um, I'm still using Scheme 48. Um, I'm just doing the development in chicken because it's... So pre-scheme, all it does is compile my scheme code. That's it. Scheme 48 is still used for that. Um, we have a question in the back, I see. Oh, um, I was going to say, I saw on the website uh, that uh, dropping system support for strings Yeah, so that's, um, I have a page on different theories and hypotheses, um, tries ways to try to improve things, questions, like can we do this better? So one of my theories is they're not necessarily um, necessary, they're related more to performance, and they don't actually do anything other than improve performance at the lowest level, so my system, um, symbols are made of a linked list of characters. Um, that's, you know, I've, that's my theory in general is performance related. We'll see what happens. Does that make sense? Yeah, but doesn't performance sometimes stop you from being able to do things? Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just ignoring performance for a long time. Um, just trying to have a powerful machine. Like I said earlier, such a long-term project that I think I need optimization I do is, is too much unless I absolutely have to to just make it run. I, I just wonder about like that with, um, you are talking about how ID integration is a big deal and stuff like that. Like, you know, the, the speed at which you get something back to a human while it's going to tap and leave it or something. What was the end of that? No, but one place where speed matters is like, is like programmer feedback. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the question was, um, are there performance issues related to um, the way I'm implementing things and how it relates to the development environment? Um, yeah, right now it is. Again, I'm just saying down the road I'll address it, um, and and maybe we can't do all of it. But my hope is we learn things we can do. And even if we could do 90% of it or 80% of it, it's probably still worth it, is what my thought is. That feed is interesting how we have the gigahertz processor, so it's like, um, that's a gazillion instructions and probes, it takes like a, the second go to the window, right? So, for a few times, sometimes. So, I don't know how to do something. Um, what are you doing about? Uh, things that culture provides, uh, communication between threads, processes, or whatever. They have mutable data structures yep. that, that they can support that. I, say, I didn't see anything at all with communication. Yeah. So the question is, what am I doing about concurrency? Yes. Um, that is one thing I do have on that, that page about theories and hypotheses. Um, I'm not sure yet. I've done a ton of research, and I, I haven't found a great solution. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I don't honestly. Sets are always in a very specific place and not everything. Right. So I think um, you know, closure has an opinionated way of doing it. Um, it doesn't, in my experience with closure, 
um, make it that much easier. Um, it does make some things easier, um, but I don't think it's the end. I don't think that's that's the best we can do. I don't. I don't even think it's close. I've seen other things like pony laying, which probably have a better concurrency model. Um, there, it's a it's a very complex. To, <laughs> I could probably talk about that for an hour in the research I've done. Um, one thing I have to say that I'm really looking into is um, trying to make it system wide um, and really the, make it so the programmer doesn't have to think about it. So the, the only way I know of so far to do that is to make everything a pure function with everything being 100% immutable data. Um, so far, that's very unwieldy, and I haven't found a great way to do that. Um, so if you want to do some research on that and get back to me. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a great answer for that. It's part of my research. Um, the advantage of what I was talking about is uh, we, the, the very lowest level interpreter OS could schedule things perfectly across every CPU. Um, it's just unwieldy. I haven't figured out a good API for it. Um, Yeah. Of any graph yes. Yes. Any yeah. There's a lot of difficulties. I all I've concluded so far is that nobody's come up with a great solution. <laughs> I think there's a lot of promising solutions, but I hope part of this is we can explore those solutions, build the tools to make it possible to explore the 50 different ways, and see if maybe 15 of them are worth keeping, or three of them, or come up with better ones. Um, but I don't have a great answer yet. Any other questions? <laughs>